Hello, my name is David Lankus. I'm the uh, Virginia and Charles Bowden Professor of Librarianship at the University of Texas at Austin. I'd like to thank, well, first the patron saint of librarianship, Anna Maria, for uh, inviting me. Uh, and I want to thank the organizers of the event for giving me some brief time. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on a very big subject. And so for that, I'm going to just sort of hit the highlights, but hopefully begin or advance or hopefully join a conversation around concepts that are very central to librarianship that are being challenged, um, that are being changed, and I think in some ways changed for the better. But I want to go through that because once again, whenever you're talking about identity within the individual as a professional or within the field, how they see the professional, it's an important topic, but it's also an emotionally connected topic. We aren't just rational about what we do and how we do it. We're invested in what we do and how we do it. So for that, I'm going to talk about neutrality, the concept that librarians can be neutral or objective or unbiased. Each one of those words in English has a slightly different meaning. But what I'm going to really talk about is the notion that librarians are somehow able to encompass the world of possibilities and represent all different views on a topic, an issue, or a discussion towards a community. I'm going to argue, not so much. In fact, so here's the sort of quick version, if you will, of what I want to talk about. I want to talk about how neutrality and the concept of improving communities are opposing concepts. Because if you want to make something better, you have to have an idea about what better means, and that instantly means you're not neutral. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. I want to talk about some of the consequences about moving away from neutrality, but also staying with neutrality. And I want to talk about, frankly, the United States craziness currently happening in the public library sector, but soon to the academic library sector, around the concept of parents' rights and book challenges and material challenges and what right does a community have to choose what materials are available and such. So I want to talk about that. And then finally, I want to talk about the concept of knowing your community. Because the build that we're going to do here is the idea that if we can't be neutral, then we must talk about how we advocate for our communities, which means we must know our communities. And they're all part of this building process to a new librarianship, if you will. Now, Anna Maria sent me some extraordinarily helpful data that was done as part of a survey. And here are two of the results. Um, when asked about asked librarians, do you feel that neutrality is part of your job? Do you feel you must be neutral in working with your community? About 50% said yes, neutrality is central and important to librarianship. And about 50% said no. This is a point in time, but if we had jumped back 20 years, 30 years, my guess is we wouldn't have gotten that even division. We would have gotten a lot more, not, uh, a lot more neutrals, even though I would argue we never have been. But we'll get there in a second. The other one, which is yay, is that seeing the idea of improving a community is fundamentally what we're about to do. We all seek to improve a community. And I'm going to use that word community a lot. So let me just give you a brief definition because it's going to become very important. Communities are a group of individuals organized around some known thing, known variable, where they live, where they work, where they study, what topic or what, what hobby they're doing, what is the task I'm accomplishing now. So I'm going to say the word community, and people are often going to say, oh, but I'm in an academic library, so he's not talking about me. Your academic library is serving a community of students and scholars and administrators and staff. If you're a law librarian, you're serving lawyers and paralegals and that group. Medical uh, librarians are serving a community of doctors and often patients and nurses, etc. So community is broad. And the first part is organized around some known variable. People know they're part of a community. That's important. But that's not enough. The second part of how you define a community is governance. How that community allocates scarce resources. Whether that's, we've got some land, do we put a library there, or do we put a school there, or do we put a music building there, right? 
or maybe it's tax dollars or tuition dollars. Sometimes it's time and attention. So this governance mechanism looks at what's scarce and figures out how to distribute it among the community. And that means that the old concept of a community, and I blame my, you know, I'm part of this, is trying to figure this out, was that a community was relatively monolithic, that we served a community. But we know increasingly that we serve a very diverse group of people in a community. In a city, it may be those with wealth. It may be those that are unhoused. It may be new citizens and immigrants. It may be people and grandparents and children. It has a great different sub-communities. And we know they're not always in sync. There's often conflict within them. Same thing in, say, an academic library, where you're serving students and you're serving faculty, and oftentimes those are picking which resource you do, how much you serve them, and in different ways. So this is the notion that we want to improve our community, but it's not as simply as saying there's one approach to every member of a community, which comes back to this concept of neutrality. So what I want to talk to you about is the illusion of neutrality. We like to think that librarianship has been about being objective and neutral. We like to think that that's been at our core since we started our trade unions and professionalization 150 years ago. That idea that built into us because the communities are diverse and have different views on politics and the arts and culture and literature and whatever it is, that we had to be above that fray. We had to serve them all and to serve them all, we had to represent every potential viewpoint. We had to not make decisions around that. Well, let's begin with some pretty simple concepts. And if you really want to spend some time on epistemology and knowledge of philosophy, I'm a pragmatist and come from that school, but work with me. First of all, your simple existence changes the community. If you work in a public library, if you work in an academic library, you've changed that community. That community had to decide to allocate resources to you. They had to make a decision whether we build a park or whether we build a library, whether we expand our library or whether we build the new science center or laboratory complex. These decisions mean that all the resources that are going to your library, including salary, are things that cannot go to other parts of the community. So that's not neutral. Someone had to make that decision. If you truly believe that libraries can have a greater impact and therefore need greater resources to do it, you have a point of view, right? Your point of view is that libraries make society better. Not everyone agrees. So simply existing is means that we are not neutral. We are influencing and impacting a society and how it works. That's one reason we can't put, I want to improve a community next to I'm neutral because you've already begun to shape what a better community is if you say a library is part of that better community. The other thing that is often presented is, okay, that's fine, but in collections, in collections in our books, right, we get this at the abstract level, but we buy books, we make sure that we are neutral in our book decisions. To which I have to say, no, you're not. One, you don't have an infinite budget. I wish I had an infinite budget. So when you go to collect materials, buy materials, license materials, organize those materials, you have to make a decision. If you have 300 books and you can only afford 200 books, you've made a decision. And you can say, well, we did it in a very rigorous, objective way. And I would argue, no, you didn't. You had to pick it. Whether you picked quality or the potential use of our community, you had some criteria by which you went through and made that decision. Most topics that we like to think of, well, we present all sides of a different topic. Most topics have infinite sides. What I mean by that is, if you take something as simple as, should we fund a library? What we're finding in the US, and I'll come back to this in a moment, is there are multiple sides to that topic. There are people who are for it because they're parents and they want their children to be educated. They are entrepreneurs and they want a place to work. They are, um, government and they want to use it for building the capacity of a community. But there will also be sides that say we shouldn't have libraries, it's use, useless, uh, it's a bad use of public dollars. Um, in an academic library, we have Google, we don't need, we have Yahoo, we don't need. We have all of these sides. 
And each one, while we may be able to clump them together, each one has its own nuance to it. And so it really isn't possible to get all sides of something because there are so many sides to every topic. Given that, there are some topics that shouldn't have multiple sides, right? We don't want to talk about pro-human trafficking. We don't want a lot of books that really encourage genocide. I would argue that climate change and climate crisis suffered for so long, and we are seeing the direct impacts as we speak in Texas heat domes and in flooding and monsoons. We're seeing this all over the world where we tried to say, well, but is there human-made climate change? Should we do something about it? We're beyond that point. We have a, sci a, a unanimity of scientific, scientific view. We need action, right? So there are topics that while we can say there are infinite perspectives, the world is round versus the world is flat. As a community, we come up with norms, communities of librarians, but the communities we live in, and we say these topics are not acceptable. These topics we are thinking are too dangerous, too outside of the mainstream, whatever it is. And we have to be aware that's not neutrality. And I would argue that you go, oh, but that's today and it's all new, but I remember back in the day. Well, back in the day, what we called neutrality and objectivity was really adoption and dissemination of a majority view, right? Well, we, we, this is how um, Italy sees itself. We see ourselves as a, as a great nation with great culture and great information. Well, who's going to argue with that? Well, probably some of the people where your great culture came from other places. We see in the UK, for example, looking at institutions like the uh, National Museum, which says, oh, we're about culture and information, and most of, the most of the information is what they pulled back from their colonies, and people are saying that's not a neutral act. Um, we have these different views. And so the community, when we sort of go with the flow, we see that as being objective, but really it's reinforcing a view of the majority. The, but all this comes down to the fact that humans are biased beings. We were created with biases. And your very life experiences influences the interactions you have with your community. But what do I mean by that? Well, one, we could look at neurological studies, we could look at psychological studies, we could look at sociological studies, data point after data point, study after study, method after method, finds out that human beings make decisions all the time. And yes, that can be extreme in the form of racism, and that can be extreme in form of xenophobia, but it's also in terms of when someone asks you a question, do you start typing on a Google search or do you turn around and look for a book? That is a bias. Where do you start in the search? The idea that you want to find multiple sources outside of your library. I know that sounds like, well, what's so non-neutral about that? Libraries, when the internet was first available, back in the late 90s and 2000s, looked at the internet as, as Michael Gorman once said, well, everything on the internet's free and you get what you pay for. And libraries looked at their collections as being the housing of quality. We have the good stuff here, right? We are the gatekeepers of good. So the idea that you're going to search for materials beyond your own building was not seen as a, um, was, was not part of the norm. The neutral was to collect the good stuff and only share the good stuff. But these days we know with born digital items, with information that we'll never find a physical form, that there's a lot of really fantastic stuff available on the internet because everything's on the internet. Government forms are on the internet. Reports from think tanks are on the internet. They don't have physical forms necessarily. So our ability to go online and work in a digital native form or not because we don't have those skills is a bias. And your life experience, my, I, I'm married to the most lovely, wonderful woman who is the first generation of her family born in America and came from Italy. And I thought, this is great. So we get back to Italy a lot, and I love Italy. I did not realize that there is a north-south divide in Italy, because in the U.S., it's Italy. But there really is a different culture. There's a different cuisine. There are different look, feel, values that come across that whole peninsula. Where you come from, what accent you use, how dark your complexion is, how long your hair is, whether you're a male or female or non-binary, the choices of a bow tie versus others, all of these impact how we are perceived and how other people are going to perceive us. We just, we know we can't get around that, right? 
I'm a professor from the United States that has a long white beard, well, not that long, a white beard and a bow tie, and therefore I must be respected and know what I'm talking about. That's an assumption. Trust me, not always a safe assumption. So we have to work with that idea. So if you can't be neutral, and you can't, you should be positive. Right? If, you, if you know that you're going to take a side, if you know that you have values and principles well stated, argued over and drawn, then you know you must move them forward. We must begin to talk about how do we advance our communities and not simply answer them. And not simply say, well, we provide a neutral service. You're providing a neutral service. Why are we paying for it? Why do we need it? You're not. You're providing the power and action to improve a community, to make it more literate, to make it more knowledgeable, to make it more appreciative of cultural heritage, to build the next generation of cultural heritage, to make it more literate in terms of reading, to make it more technologically adapt, to make it more economically interesting, to advance science, to advance, right? All of these words of advance, improve, etc., they're not neutral. And so what I'm going to argue is that you need to replace the concept of neutrality, not throw it away, but replace it with the concept of intellectual honesty. That is, we are not neutral, but we work really hard to represent the different facets of a topic, to serve the different parts of our population, to work and represent the diversity of our communities. We work at it, and it is work. And the important shift from talking about neutrality, which is what we assume we are, to intellectual honesty, which is what we strive for. This is passive. We are neutral. This is active. We actively work to understand our community, their needs, the topics under discussion, how we present them, and how we understand it. My academic library colleagues, this is how science is. When we're supporting science from the humanities to the social sciences to the hard sciences, we talk about the scientific method and we talk about the quest for truth. We often see the scientific method in science as objective. It is not. It is fundamentally not. The core of science, the core of the scientific principle developed over five centuries, is the notion that we always strive to know the truth, but we will never arrive there. The concept of a theory, a theory of uh, germ theory, which guides medicine to this day, of evolution, which guides medicine to this day, the theory of, you know, physics and quantum physics and all these really hard scientific truths aren't truths. They're our best explanation for the data we have encountered. But the core of science is something called falsifiability. The minute you find one bit of data or one concept that doesn't fit into that theory, out goes the theory and we start again. That means that we never find the truth. We just have the best explanation for now. Science, and I would argue librarianship, is passion, is, is, is what is driving us. What do we know? What is internally and what is unique to us that we just have to explore this? Passion explored with dispassionate tools. I have this great passion, but I know if I just go look, I'm only going to find what I want to see. So I'm going to put this methodology in front of me that's going to force me to look beyond my own preconceptions. That attempts to get to an objective view, always an attempt, but it's intellectually honest. It is work. We are not talking about replacing neutrality with do whatever the hell you want. The idea is to replace your neutrality by with active methods of ensuring you represent the diversity of your community in your actions. The diversity of community in a collection, in a service, in a program, in marketing, whatever it is. The opposite of neutrality in librarianship is not utter bias and a, you know, ideological tilt. It is actively seeking to engage our community and ensuring that the information they're working with is verifiable, which is authentic, which is practicable that meets their needs, even if their needs are to learn new things. So what I'm asking you for is not to say librarians are no, not neutral. I am asking you that. I'm asking you to say that librarians are passionate and are 
um, effort to improve society, but we are aware and make sure that we have methods, principles, and values to serve the entirety of that community. So if you can't be neutral, let's work for better. And the other reason that people often don't want to give, get rid of the concepts of neutrality that I understand is that it will open us up to things we don't want to talk about. And oftentimes, the United States these days, and Texas, where I'm from in particular, are their example. If we lose neutrality, if we don't become objective arbiters, if we are not seen as unbiased, our communities will lose faith in us. They will see us as political agents. They will see us as biased entities that must be closed down, fought against, etc. And so you're right in the sense that Texas, it definitely looks that way. In my lovely home, we are in the midst of, and by the way, it's not just Texas and Florida, it's all over the United States, and it's not just the United States, it's happening all over the world. We are seeing activism around librarianship, but not activism to support them, but to censor them. There is active moves to go into public, school, and academic libraries and say, this information is not going to be available to my community. My community will not support this information. There is nothing wrong with the concept of a community questioning a collection. There, in fact, it's a good thing when a community is engaged enough with your library to ask about collections and decisions and methods. Nothing wrong. What we're finding is the problem in the United States is that parents in particular and the public want to remove information not through a clear and consistent and transparent process where the whole community is involved in that discussion. They want to bypass all of our professionalism, all of our method, all of the work we do around intellectual honesty and replace it with ideology. This is pornography. This is grooming. This information needs to go out. In the United States right now, communities are labeling great, wonderful, amazing librarians, pedophiles. And those librarians are walking around in their own communities where they shop and where they eat and where they work and where they socialize, knowing that there are parts of the community everywhere they go that looks at them as if they're pedophiles, as if they are corrupting the youth. The language that is used in this is despicable. They dox people. Now, if you're not familiar with that phrase, what it means is they identify librarians and they give out their home phone number and their home address to harass individual librarians. And I have seen many a fantastic librarian leave the field because of this kind of constant attack. Now, this kind of constant attack is the minority view, but it is the loudest and most organized view. Back to that idea of a community being whole, it is not. And some of the, well, they come from outside of the community. Yes, but they find traction within it. A community consists of a lot of different views in conflict, including views of the library. If you say, well, I can't give up neutrality um, because you know, the library is, is that neutral place that everyone can come and use. And the answer is the parts of the community don't agree that. You think a neutral view is to provide lots of different resources and views around a topic, and theirs is, no, 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 this goes against the law of God or this is pornography, or this is something parents don't want, and therefore they don't see your actions and your view of neutrality as neutral, they see you as an ideology. The ideology of put it all out there and let people look at it, about sharing all aspects of the information because the individual can understand that. And they're seeing that as a dangerous liberalism that must be stamped out. And it doesn't just stop with children's books. We've already seen it happen in university sections where in certain states, information about women's health, information about abortions, information about contraception, information about basic biology is being attacked at the university level. So just because you do good research doesn't mean that you're immune. Now, once again, is the goal to sit back and say, all right, what we'll do is we're so neutral, you can't mess with us, right? Because we're going to have your view. Your view will be there, but these other views will be there. That doesn't work. The response to librarians under attack is not neutrality. The American Library Association has tried that language and it fails. I've talked to many a library director who says we go to the American Library Association when we have these challenges 
And the answer from the American Library Association is to stand up, fight, put out the purity of the message of our neutrality, and it will, and you will prevail. And these library di directors say, and I will lose my budget, and I will get fired, and I will have my staff harassed, and I won't be able to serve the people who need it, and people that don't believe in their ideology will no longer come and trust the library. It doesn't work. Instead, we have to say we are trained professionals with these tools. And if you have a challenge to this material, great. We are up for it because we want to invite you in to the process where we have constructive dialogue, where we build the dialogue around this, where we do this kind of work. So it's not, a, I'm not asking you to go and fight hand-to-hand -hand combat, but the concept that somehow we can hide behind neutrality or neutrality is above reproach. It is an unquestionable truth that everyone in society should look to is wrong and is in itself a non-neutral ideology. The way that we fight and support against these things, the way that we talk about the relevance of libraries, the way we get to know our community so that one, one small part of that community has an outsized voice and is aggressive against the library is to build a stronger community that will then support the library. This is what we're seeking to do. The true way forward from moving from the concept of an unbiased, above the fray, serving a community at arm's length, believing that when the community moves over the doorstep into our libraries, they have left the complex and conflicted world and come to an oasis of knowledge, is done. Your community does not end at your door, and it doesn't begin at your door. You are part of the community. The way forward to know your community, how, you know, they're crazy, they're complex. Some like us, some don't know us. Oh, they have old fashioned views. Oh, they have new views. How do we deal with this complex mishmash? Because in the olden days, the community were people who walked in the door and knew about us. And now the community are people who walk in the door with video to videotape us and, and create social action against us. How do we respond to that? We get deeper into the community. You are part of your community. That means you have a voice. You could push for the idea of multiple viewpoints, of wide collections with great diversity of viewpoints, the idea that we serve all, the idea that we can be the voice for the marginalized, that we can be the voice for the minoritized, that we can be the ones who work with everyone, whatever your voice you want. You need that voice in a community social context. And if you engage the community before they get pissed off, and you engage the community before they come out, you're going to do better. So you must knit together your diverse communities. Find your allies, find those who are aggressive against you, but bring them into a form of conversation. The value of the library is not that it's a neutral space, it's that it's a civil space. Academic, public, doesn't matter. This is a place that people with passions can come and have discourse in a safe environment for that discourse. Where there is a facilitator, as a professional, read yourselves, who can moderate that conversation and seek agreement and commonality. That's the knitting we need to do. Find the people who need us, find the people who love us, and bring them together and then bring in the people that hate us and don't know about us and ignore us and begin a real enriched and informed dialogue towards what value we bring to this community. Seek power for the marginalized. Those loud voices seeking to censor books and materials in my home state, they do not represent the skin tones and the religious affiliations of the minorities. They don't bring in a larger view. And that's our job. Challenge materials. Question them. Question our neutrality. Question our decisions. And we should be able to back up those decisions, purchasing decisions, service decisions, hours decisions, building decisions, by a process based on intellectual honesty where it is transparent and disclosed and inclusive. Not neutral. It is transparent. It is inclusive. It is rational. That's where we are. That's the value that we bring to it. So we are not neutral. We are not objective. We are not unbiased. We are intellectually honest. 
We are professionals who've been trained to work in the crazy foment of knowledge infrastructure where AI is disrupting the world as we speak, and that's the world we live in, and we have to have the expertise to go to a frightened community and say, it's okay, let's work on this together. We can do this together. Seek justice for all. Build a movement. Instead of thinking of your library as you and a building and a collection, think of your library as a force in, in physics, the idea that it is some energy that can be used to push forward. In this case, we want to push our communities forward. We hope we're pushing with everyone else side by side. We know a few people are going to just sort of ride it. We know some people are going to push back, but we want to be that movement forward to progress our community, to make our communities more humane, to make our communities more knowledgeable, to make our communities more successful, to make our communities thriving, to make our communities better. If you're a librarian because you love sorting books, great, fine. But if sorting books doesn't help a community find that material, you are helping yourself and not anyone else. How what we buy, where we shelve, how big are the shelves, all that, whether we leave the buildings, whether we meet them online in Zoom, whether we meet them and provide them Wi-Fi, whether we are the one public toilet that's available in our area, we are a movement that says people matter. And we are people and we are going to work with you side by side to push forward our university, our town, our school. We are a force of organizers. We bring people together, we facilitate, we have hard conversations. But we can have those hard conversations so that with basic con fundamental ideas of democracy, of participation, of welfare, of human justice, these are why we have a library. Not because we have a bunch of stuff we don't know where to put it otherwise. That stuff, that cultural heritage, that collection is the kindling for the engine of inclusion that a library is. That's what we're trying to do. And that's not a neutral act. We use rationality. We use great skills. We use information organization. We use information seeking. We seek diversity. We seek multiple viewpoints. We have an active organic process, but not for itself, but for the community. We're the ones who are going to stoke the fire of invention. We're the ones who are going to mobilize the communities to save our climate. We're going to be the ones that fight against fascism. We're going to be the ones that fight against authoritarianism, not because we as individuals know that's the right thing to do, but because our communities tell us that. And our communities fractured and divided and censored will never be able to push off the yoke of oppression. I know that sounds grand when I started with the concept of neutrality, but that's what's at stake here. Your job is to improve society. And whenever you use the word improve, you don't document it, you don't organize it, you don't sort it, you don't record it, you improve it. You're not neutral. You're noble. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.